All right, welcome everyone to um, the Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Directors meeting for Wednesday, March 2nd, um, starting at 6.35 p.m. Uh, we have some exciting uh, new additions. Um, congratulations to Rhett, Emma, and our newest board member, Seiji, uh, and also congratulations to Zach and Merritt, uh, who were selected last meeting, but um, are started for the first uh, meeting. So um, after we have public comment um, <clears throat> and the consent agenda, uh, we can go around and introduce ourselves and talk a little bit about why we're on the board. Um, and Seiji, we have an admittedly um, in progress uh, onboarding process, as uh, I think I told you uh, when I texted you last night. Um, and first, I want to confirm everyone got sworn in. Excellent. Um, so we're all official. Um, but we will, uh, I'm going to encourage, I know Libby and I have already reached out to you uh, about a meeting. Uh, we will assign you a mentor and I'll be asking for a, a brave member to um, to step up for that. But that's just basically someone who you can kind of lean on to, to walk you through, you know, to ask the, the questions that you think like, I should know this, but I don't, which you're going to have a lot of those. Um, and uh, yeah, and then yeah, the VSBA has some good materials, uh, which I also pointed to you last night. Um, you know, our policies are there, so um, you know, and I encourage, I really encourage every board member to to reach out to Seiji and um, you know try to try to meet him for lunch or or coffee or um, a, a phone call or something, just to uh, get to know him a little and share the experience. Um, and then similarly, American Zach, super excited to have you here. Uh, thanks so much uh, for doing this. Um, definitely also want to discuss ways that we can include you. What the, I know we had a little hiatus from, uh, from having students, uh, but one thing that the last crop of students we um, had did, which was pre-pandemic, was they gave pretty much every board meeting uh, like a 10 to 15 minute presentation on whatever they wanted. It could be a matter that was really, you know, pressing for um, for the school and the students. Uh, it could be just an overview of, of things that were going on, um, uh, you know, school events, et cetera. Um, so if you're interested in, in that or something else, um, would love to hear your ideas. We definitely want to make sure that, um, you know, we involve you as, as much as possible um, on the board, and, and we really, you know, one of the main reasons you're here, in addition to, uh, you know, giving a voice to the students so that we can can hear about, um, you know, what the students are concerned about and what's going on in the school. Um, you know, and also, there's only a couple of us that have high school students here. So, um, you know, hearing about the, the great stuff in the high school, it's going to be news to a lot of, of the board members because they don't, don't, you know, hear about it at dinner time. Um, all right, excellent. Uh, so do we have uh, any public comment? It looks like we do not. Um, anyone on screen? Great. Uh, do have a motion to approve the consent agenda? And for the new members, the consent agenda is, is consists of uh, basic items like the approval of minutes, uh, the warrant that allows us to to pay staff, um, the superintendent's reports, uh, and kind of other basic items that really don't require discussion but require board action. Uh, so what we do with the consent agenda, the the items on the consent agenda are included in the board packet. Um, if you have any questions about them, you can. Uh, make a motion to to take a certain item off the consent agenda for discussion otherwise we just do a motion approving the consent agenda uh it gets a second if it if it passes all the items on the consent agenda are approved again if, if someone takes a motion off or a, an item off the consent agenda we approve everything but that item 
then we have a separate discussion about whatever the concern or question is about the item that got removed. Uh, and then we separately move to approve that item. Emma, did you have your hand up? No, but I think you read my mind because yeah. I did want to just sort of clarify for the student members yes. what their mm -hmm. role will be. I mean, we. I know you're both going to meet with Jim to talk more in depth about what your role will be, but um, in the description of the student representatives, we talked about how they're non-voting members. Yes. So could you explain to them just quickly, just for the sake of this meeting, what they can expect for that? Yeah, so um, when we when we take action, like we're about to on the consent agenda, um, the board members will vote and the way the board is organized. Um, you know, we're a merger of two towns. Uh, we're governed by the uh, merger agreement. Um, there are uh, nine members, uh, seven from Montpelier and two from Roxbury. Um, because we did not want to uh, have an enormous board or uh, just one Roxbury member, what the merger agreement did was it gave each Montpelier member two votes um, and each Roxbury member one vote. <clears throat> so every elected member has, well, the Montpelier members have two votes. No one has yet used the two votes to vote differently on things, but I think theoretically they could. Uh, and, um, and, and each Roxbury member has, has one vote. Generally, we do not have close votes, so that hasn't become an issue in terms of you know, something passing or not passing. Um, and then the student representatives are you know, non-voting members, so you, you don't have a vote, but you um, clearly have the ability to participate in discussion, to make comments. Um, and the way we participate in discussion is raise hand and the chair, which is which is me, um, will recognize the the member. Um, and yeah, you know, we try to we try to you know cue as, as much as possible and um, you know kind of take the airtime time we need. Um, but we really want to hear from you on discussion. And even though you can vote, you can certainly weigh in with how you think those who can vote should vote. Um, or you know, give give reasons why um, you know, we should should consider X instead of Y. So um, so when we actually take a vote, uh, we do yay or nay. If the if it's the voice doesn't make it obvious, we'll go around and actually do a you know kind of a, a count vote. Um, the chair does not vote unless the chair's vote is needed to, um, to break the tie. Why that is, I don't know, but that's the way it is. <laughs> it's like you're the vice president. And usually, well, for the, when the, yes. when a motion is made, there'll be a motion made, yep. second, second, and then before it's voted on, there'll be discussion time. So that would be an appropriate time if you have any questions or want to talk about something, you could talk about it then. Yeah. But probably not make motions or set, can they make motions and second motions? No. Uh, no. Okay. So I mean you you could suggest a motion for someone else to make. Um, okay. but yeah. someone else would have to make that motion. So I mean I don't think it'll come into play yeah. tonight on tonight's agenda. It's not yeah. there's not a lot going on for that, but just so that you know how things work. Yeah. And we also have a lot of discussion without action. Um, for instance. You know, someone might come in, Libby might come in and, and present on, uh, you know, special education throughout the district. And, you know, she might do that with the special education director. Um, and there, you know, there's a lot of discussion based on that, but we don't have necessarily any item that we're approving or anything. So, you know, during those times, you're very willing to, you know, make comments, ask questions, et cetera, like any other board member. Um, really, the only thing that that you won't be able to do is when we have a formal action like we're about to take with the consent agenda um, to vote on that. But again, like we, we definitely, if you have opinions about how we should vote or input on you think that would be important um, in helping us decide our vote, we, we want to hear it. Great. Um, 
Yeah, no, you don't. <laughs> okay, yeah. We actually mix up the seating arrangement every time, I think. Pretty well, so, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I think I've been over there. Libby just does random out of <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> That's where like, I pull the names. I don't want to stop to each other in class, so I'm going to separate the troublemaker. <laughs> um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Do you have a second? Second. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, any opposed? Great. So now um, we have to organize ourselves, uh, um, which means appointing board roles and um, committee assignments. So I'm just going to pull up the committee page here so I've got it. Anna also very helpfully sent it to us just a few hours ago or whatever that was. Um, so we need a chair, a vice chair, um, a clerk, a parliamentarian, and do we still need a treasurer? I think so, yeah. And a treasurer. There's nothing right. here. I think that was actually voted on. I think that's a that's a that's a district uh, position, be. isn't There's it? Someone, isn't that yeah. a yeah. Shelby well, Shelby Quinn? Yes. 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 Okay. Sorry. So we need a chair, vice chair, clerk, parliamentarian. And who's our current clerk? Our current clerk was Jerry. And yes. did, we, <laughs> did, we, did we replace her? Like, oh, I don't that's what I thought. I think we just put Rhett in the role because he took over for Yes, I think that's what we did too. Um, <laughs> you worked very hard at the clerk role of Rhett. And was Jill parliamentarian? I believe yeah. so, yeah. yeah. And Mia, you are interested in vice chair? I'd be happy to serve as vice chair. And I would be honored to serve as chair again, but if, also happy to if have you want to, someone else who's interested. If you want to throw me out, I'm... so I I make a motion that we reappoint Jim Murphy as the chair of the Montclair Roxbury School Board of Directors. Second. Any discussion? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the motion. <laughs> She Jim is chair. Oh, yeah. Jim to chair. Yeah. Jim, do you want to be chair? I think so. Okay. <laughs> Great. I would, I would love, I love, I love being your chair. Don't worry. Um, yes. No, thank you very much. It's, it's an honor to, to serve uh, as chair. And I really appreciate it. So thank you. Um, yeah. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Um, do you have a motion for vice chair? I move to um, nominate Mia Moore as vice chair. I'll second that. Okay. Uh, any discussion? Thank you, Mia. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Um, motion for clerk. The rest, do you want to do it again? Again, <laughs> you did actually do it. There was one meeting where yeah. Wi-Fi was down, and you were like, you, "We asked you to take some notes because Anna, sure. Anna was not in contact with us." Sure. That was some peer pressure, right? Yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I was just providing contact. Yeah. I was just providing contact. Do you prefer parliamentarian? No, I just think I need to do a better job of my Your clerkship. <laughs> I think fortunately Adam makes the, the clerk job very easy. A pretty light left. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a motion to appoint uh, Rhett as clerk. So second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Congratulations, Rhett. Um and Jill, you wanna I'd be happy to. 
I see you even got your, you got your book. Order. She's actually looking through it. <laughs> She was, she was keep making sure Jim was saying the right thing. Yeah. That's what she was doing. Um, and so for those who I didn't know, the parliamentary is someone who just tries to keep our motions done correctly and make sure that we're following the, the right steps in our orders of the process of the meeting. I move Jill Remick to be parliamentarian. I second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Um, and any opposed? Great. Thank you. Congratulations, Joel. All right. Thank you. Uh, so next um, is committee assignments. And uh, so we do a lot of our work in committees. Uh, we obviously do work here, but then uh, we have committees of, I think they're all three member, we may have a couple four member um, committees uh, that actually do a lot of the work and kind of bring some of the work back to the board. Um, the committees are all somewhat different, I think in terms of kind of their work involvement and intensity. Um, you know, we have some committees like, uh, well, I have both, standing committees that we just have all the time and then we have a couple of special committees uh, that are only working for a period of time i think right now the only active um committee we have that is not standing is the district-wide visioning committee um the rest meet either kind of regularly or semi-regularly um the some of the you know the, the names kind of imply what, what they do. Uh, our policy committee works bi-weekly and um, we're, we're not technically a policy governance board, but we govern through our, our policies. Um, and the policy committee both uh, adopts new policies and revises and updates old policies. Um, it meets bi-weekly. Right now we're actually looking at a lot of our policies to try to to streamline them, make them a little more consistent with some of the Vermont School Board Association models, because we're actually not quite sure, I think, where some of our policies came from. Um, they've been around for a while. Um, and uh, I'd say that's that's a pretty busy committee. The members on the old board were um, Emma's, Emma's chair, uh, Amada Garces, and uh, myself. And then we also had a fourth member Andrew was was a fourth member. That is a committee that actually might be able to absorb four. Um, the finance committee meets. How often does the finance is it quarterly? Quarterly. Get, quarterly. Um, when we get the budget presented to us, um, a lot of the presentations at a pretty high level, just because it's a it's a big budget and there's only really so much detail that we can absorb and know. Um, but we do want to have at least some members kind of taking a peek behind the numbers that in a little more detail. So uh, the job of the finance committee is to meet quarterly with the superintendent and with the business manager uh, and do a deeper dive into the budget numbers. And uh, essentially, if the finance committee feels that there's something that the board needs to pay a deeper level of attention to or that needs to be brought to the board's attention it's it's a finance committee's job to do that so the finance committee really kind of does um a deeper oversight over the the budget and, and finance process um and is is kind of the gatekeeper of of deciding you know whether or not the, the level of detail the board is getting is adequate or whether the board should should know about um you know more uh the equity committee is relatively new. Um, it's uh, Amanda, yeah, Mia, and Kristen. Kristen. Mm -hmm. um, it's really looking at kind of all of the district's works through an equity lens. Um, that committee has also been very active. Obviously, you know, equity is a, a huge concern and a huge value of the district. Um, and one that's, um, it really risen to the fore relatively recently. So 
Um, you know, I think like a lot of, of school districts, a lot of organizations, we're really trying to look at everything we do through an equity lens and, um, you know, propose changes that are going to be transformative on that level. Uh, the negotiations committee is one of those committees that can be super quiet like it is now when we have a multi-year deal, um, or it can be extremely intense when uh, we're in negotiations. It's also, it's, it's really one of the most important committees. Um, it's not necessarily the sexiest. In fact, it might be one of the least sexy, uh, but it's, it's extremely important because when we do negotiate, we've got three unions and we have to negotiate contracts um, with all of them. Um, so it really kind of requires, uh, you know, knowing what the contract looks like, knowing the details of the contract, um, uh, you know, spending, spending a lot of time, you know, often, you know, in negotiations with, with the, the various unions, uh, yeah, you know, working through the details and then coming back to the board and reporting how that's progressing. And, and you know, the the board ultimately um, ultimately approves, uh, but um, you know, the negotiations committee does the brunt of the work, and that requires not just working with the teachers, but also you know, working closely with Libby and her staff, um, you know, who really help with that. Um, uh, you know, having I think a command of you know, the budget numbers, looking at other districts, seeing, seeing what's happening throughout the state, uh, you know, working with the district's lawyer, um, because a lot of this is, is pretty technical and pretty legal. Um, some people love that work. Um, your predecessor, Andrew Stein, really got into it. Um, Anna Kidd is fantastic at it. I don't, I can't speak to, I Anna can't speak to his passion for it, head. but um, he's, he's, he's been very effective. Uh, as has you know, everyone who's I think has participated um, on it, uh, but that's a yeah. Right now we have a, a multi-year deal with the union. Um, we'll start negotiating next year with two we'll, of the unions. Yeah, we'll start negotiating with two of the unions next year. And for a while, we had a series of one-year deals. Uh, so that committee was um, kind of you know, right. do, yeah. It was it was it was doing some. Uh, some some wind sprints pretty pretty frequently. Um, the superintendent evaluation committee is you know some of the primary jobs of the board. The primary jobs really of the board are you know just making sure that the you know implementing the policies of the district, making sure that that's being done. But budget and superintendent evaluation are you know huge huge parts of of the board's role. Um, the superintendent evaluation committee uh, helps uh, develop the the process for for that. Um, we've got a template that we've used that um, Mia has done a fantastic job of of updating. Uh, it's a team effort, Jim. It's a team effort. Yes. Well, you're leading us uh, and doing a doing a great job. And uh, you know, working with the superintendent to to set goals. Uh, and then to measure those goals and then to you know go to the board and just making sure that the superintendent is doing the type of job we expect her to do, um, uh, which she absolutely is. Thank you. Uh, and, um, yeah, and then also doing recommendations in terms of compensation, um, you know, the contract with the superintendent, et cetera. Um, so, and that's a committee that's, that's relatively active, but certainly I think it's more active during those, those kind of goal setting periods. And then, you know, at the time when, um, you know, we near the evaluation um, and, and recommendations time. Uh, and then facility and energy committee um, is, you know, really responsible with, with working closely with, with Andrew LaRosa, who's here, who's um, a director of, of facilities for the district um, and making sure that, you know, the, the buildings are being well maintained and that, um, you know, the, uh, the infrastructure needs that we have are being met. Um, and I think increasingly, uh, you know, we're really getting calls from, I'm sure the students can tell us about this, uh, calls to be part of the solution on energy and, and climate change. Um, you know, and part of that committee's role is, uh, you know, is, is working with, 
with the district, working with students, et cetera, to um, you know, find ways where we can um, be as, as energy efficient and as, as climate um, responsible as, as possible. Um, and then the district-wide visioning committee is a, a part of a process that um, we put together. Uh, one thing that you know, both Roxbury and Montpelier had prior to merger that that, not, that we don't have now are, is kind of a real clear set of goals and visions and, and ends for the district that we can uh, you know, measure uh, our work on. And I think we all have ideas of, of what our, our district's values and visions are, uh, but we haven't really gone through the process of, of putting that together, uh, articulating that, um, and then using that to guide our work. Um, yeah, so one of the, the main goals of the district-wide visioning committee uh, is to um, you know, get input from you know, all of our community, uh, you know, from you know, Roxbury to, to Montpelier, um, you know, all of the various uh, groups and interests and um, you know, diverse voices we have and, and come up with um, you know, some recommendations for the board on you know really putting forth some some goals and visions that we can then use to you know to guide our work and, and to guide some of you know the decisions we have to make um in the coming years and that is uh, is going to be pretty intense work but it's also work with uh, light at the end of the tunnel um i think right now our current goal is to wrap up most of the committee work by is it may um and then have some solid recommendations to the board that we can can use, um, uh, you know, in in the later spring and, and through summer, uh, and then hopefully have kind of, you know, starting in full swing by uh, the time we do our next budget. So anything I, I missed? And a question I have is, um, since do you, it's probably more work than cut out for, but do you want any involvement in the committees? Um, yeah. Merrick's on the district wide visioning committee. Yeah. The other awesome. thing to keep in mind is all of the committee meetings, with the exception of some of the negotiations meetings, are open meetings. So yeah. it's like you would also just be welcome to sort of drop in. On any of those, yeah, um, you get you'll get emails from Anna telling you when they are and agendas and Zoom links and all of that stuff. So anytime you want to, you know, if you were interested in sort of dropping in, and then if there was something that like caught your eye or became a, a particular interest for you, you could always more officially sort of join the committee. Yeah. So so whatever way you want to proceed. So Anna will send out the mm -hmm. and all that. Yeah. We can talk about it on Friday. Yep. Yep. You don't have to make a commitment tonight. You could sort of wait and then take your time to decide and and your top your level of time and your availability. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Because we can we can add um, add or drop numbers kind of with, with simple action. Um. So with that in mind, I I know Amanda is. Let me get let me call her email. Um, I think unable to come. She was interested in saying on policy and equity, correct? Right, right, uh, and and um, hoping to give up her seat on the district wide district -wide vision, which is that short term committee yeah. that's gone through May. I was hoping that maybe Sage might take her spot. <laughs> Don't know if you're interested in that one. One thing I can say, I'm sorry. I've the upgrade as long as I can get back to you. I have not really much experience in this, obviously, but yeah. I, mean, I, I think it would be great. And, and I think you absolutely would be very effective. Uh, I think most of the meetings are other nighttime meetings. So I don't know how that, that works through the schedule, but. Um, They're oh, Mondays. Mondays. And they've only had two meetings so far. So yeah. I don't think you would be, you know, I think you'd be able to jump in and, and hit the ground running kind of thing. Yeah. 
And I'm also sure the uh, the consultant that we're using is uh, Nathan Suter. Uh, and I'm he's he lives in Montpelier, and I'm sure he would be more than happy to uh, you know spend some time with you, getting you up to speed. And and Red is the other member yeah. on the board, and um, not to volunteer you, Red, but I'm guessing you'd also be quite willing to. The other part of it is it involves a lot of outreach, so it's a chance to sort of hear what people are thinking. Hopefully, all is well. And you know, introduce yourself to people as well, which I think is a, is an important part of being in this role. I'll connect to Sage with Nathan. So, do we have to officially make a motion, or mm -hmm. how does this work? We have to officially make a motion. And do we, are we per? Um, yeah. yeah. So I move that we appoint um, Sage Ohashi. Is that how it's pronounced? Yeah. And Rhett Williams to the district wide vision committee. Second. Um, discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Thank you, Seiji. Thank you, Rhett. And I think, did Amanda ask to be on the negotiations committee? Yeah. She'd like to be there. So maybe we could do that one next. I don't know how you're feeling, but it seems like you have more committees than anyone else right now. You sure do. I don't know if that's okay with you. Um, if that's how you want it. Well, um, it's hard because there's a lot to be learned that I haven't yet learned from all of these committees. I feel like if I had been through a cycle of any of them, I would be more... Right. inclined to give them up but without no without having an opportunity to learn what they're about and understand them i i don't i mean the finance committee would be my least life except for that we'd have to replace grant and figure out how that process goes so i don't know what that will look like but it may right. maybe it evolved and so I don't want to, it may involve a lot of learning because as we're sort of bringing someone new in, that's kind of, so I don't know. I, I'm asked, if anyone wants to be on any, if anyone wants to take my place and they want to arm wrestle, <laughs> I don't know. I don't have any really strong feelings except for I, I, I want opportunities to learn from all of them. So for negotiations, since Andrew Stein is down, could we just nominate, um, if, is anyone else really wanting to get on there? Or could we just nominate Amanda along with the rest of the people who are already on it? Everybody who's already on it still with the And I can't, don't even. <laughs> it is very important on the negotiations committee that somebody who truly understands the finances of the district is on that committee. That is, yes. that is a very important role. So while I don't want to speak for people, I look to Amanda and Jill, or I'm sorry, Anna Kit and Jill, who do truly know finances pretty well. And I'm only saying that because of Anna Kit's wizardry with, with spreadsheets, which if you haven't seen yet is a thing of beauty. But I also know Anna Kit's very busy yeah. right now. No, I'll be, I'll be happy to be on the negotiations committee. Don't want to nominate you guys but no i'm not thank you yeah no i'm willing to stay on too and also i mean it's a larger committee but when we're negotiating with three unions at the same time there's there's only yeah we did manage to space it out so it will be yeah. two and one going forward but next year will be our instructional assistants and our teaching staff yeah so a quorum of that committee would be three then three people then if it's a five-person committee Typically, what they do is they split when there's two unions, you don't do both unions, because that equals a lot of work when we're negotiating at the same time. So typically, it's I'll take the I, you know, this group takes the IAs and this group takes the teachers. Uh -huh. and there's maybe some overlap, but um, yeah, last year we had three, so there was overlap. Yeah. Okay. I think, uh, I think Jim was the overlap. I think I was an I you, and you were, the, yeah. um, other one, not teachers, yeah. but this year we'll be able to minimize it. Yeah, negotiations don't act like 
I mean, we'll, we'll have them. They, they're not, you know, they're, they're sitting down and negotiating. They're, they're not a open meeting. Got it. So we, their quorum doesn't necessarily apply. Yeah. I go into an executive asking, session. I was just yeah. asking because the, the larger the, if, if quorum applied, the larger the size of the committee, the larger the quorum gets, which yeah. then becomes a problem. If you can't all be there, then you're like, oh, now we can't have this meeting. So anyway, it's good to know that quorum doesn't necessarily apply because of the activity of the committee. Yeah. And it also sounds like a bigger committee would be helpful. Yeah, I was just going to say that if you have six people in that committee, you can split it. Um, but also, it would be helpful to have the same people continue um, yeah. negotiating with the same unions. Seiji, is there anything? I mean, I feel like since you're the person that's stepping in as the newest and you're not already assigned, is there a particular committee that I mean, speaks to you? The ones that jump out to me, I'd say, would be equity and then the facilities and energy. Um, but um, also, I, mean, I, I don't want to try and take on too much before I get to speak, but those are the two that I caught my eye. Uh, And so how about that finance? Would we need to fill Andrew's position on finance or do we feel like four or sorry, three people is enough? I think three is probably enough. I'm comfortable with three on finance. Um, and that's, is that Annika, Jill and Rhett? Rhett? I, I think that's plenty solid. And so, does any, did anyone else have an interest in jumping around or doing something different? Or are we ready to kind of like go through these motions? Yeah, yeah and, I mean, Andrew's on facilities, so that would be perfect for Sagey to, perfect for Sagey to swap mm -hmm. and then I'll defer to the equity committee, but right now it's a three-person committee. Do you think it could be a four-person committee? Okay. Yeah. Stage for your inventory too, in terms of time, facilities, and energy, aspirationally dates quarterly. So we're trying to get on a more normal, regular schedule. Okay. But at this point, that's where it stands. Cool. And the uh, equity committee meets basically every other week. Well, that's, that's a good balance, too. Well, with, yeah, and with the visioning sure. committee, I think you'll, that's, I think that's enough. Okay. For now, right? For you now. always jump into another one. You always jump into another one, but um, yeah, you don't want your family members saying, what you do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, at least not too quickly. So uh, I moved to appoint Amanda Garza's Anakit uh, called Carney, Jill Remick, Rhett Williams, and Jim Murphy to the negotiations committee. Great. Um, do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Um, so finance committee. Um, I move to appoint Brett Williams, Anakit, Kulkar <laughs> Kulkarni. That's How do right. I pronounce it? Kulkarni. 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 Um, and Jill Remick to the Finance Committee. Do you have a second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, policy Committee. Emma, this is going to just keep going, going Emma. You, <laughs> yeah, yeah Emma, I'm or someone else wants to get on the break. And Amanda Garces to Policy Committee. I so have a second. Um, discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Um, equity committee. I move to appoint Seiji Ohashi, Amanda Garces, Kristen Gettler, and Mia Moore to the equity committee. Second? Second. Uh, discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Um, facilities and energy committee. I move to appoint Seiji Ohashi, Kristen Gettler, Jill Remick, and Emma Bay Hansen to the Facilities and Energy Committee. Second. 
Second. Uh, discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? And superintendent evaluation committee. I have to appoint Jim Murphy, Brett Williams, Anna Pitt Kilparney, and Mia Moore to the superintendent evaluation committee. Any, do you have a second? Second. Discussion? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. I think that, that's it. That's it. Great, we are organized. And just oh, thanks, thanks for putting the document <laughs> together, whoever put the document together uh, to list the committees and that was helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it would be Emma or um, Anna, I'm sure. So we had that last couple of years. We were always trying to figure out. So I want to head over to you for the ESSER presentation. Yep. And thank you. Um, thank you, Mike, Bill, and Andrew for um, being patient and for us to organize ourselves. If the trio would take the chair in front of the microphone. Which one of you brought a guitar? That's what I tried to tell Barry he needed to have. We stole the table so the students could have a table. Okay. <laughs> we thought they looked there. They look very, very good right there like that. <laughs> so, um, so Grant is also with us. He's just virtual right now. Um, so if we have any questions for Grant, he is, I'm sure, more than happy. Uh, Anakin and, and Sagey, I'm sorry for the turn. If you want to move your chair, you're more welcome to join the gentleman here too. Is it on the, yeah. it was yeah. in the packet? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. yeah, it's changed slightly a oh, little bit, but that, but not a big deal. Um, so we put together this presentation um, for the board around our plans for spending the ARP ESSER money. Um, as I've talked to the board in the past, it's really hard to talk about one funding source coming into the district without talking about all the funding sources. Um, so the way that I organized this was I put it into themes of what we heard from the community and what we know of from our needs in the district and put basically all the new things or things we had in there from our local budget, from Medicaid, from um, ESSER, ESSERs 1 and 2, um, ARP, like basically all the different funding sources we have because um, one of the things I learned in this process uh, very early on was um, for instance, when people said we need more support for social emotional learning. And I said, well, talk to me about what you mean when you say that um, it was, well, we don't have any social workers. And it's like, well, no, we do have social workers but it's paid for out of a different funding source. Um, it's just not necessarily in this particular funding source. So I wanna make sure that the board um, and our community understands that Part of our job, the four or five of our jobs with granted included too, is to know what all of those funding sources are, what we can use it for, and what are the best ways to, like, how do we, how do we extend those dollars the best we can based on the, the way we're allowed to use those sources. Does that make sense? So Mike's in charge, for instance, of Title A. You can't use Title A on a whole lot of stuff. Right, so we have to really focus on um, intervention services through Title One A, and it's really it's much easier if we use those dollars to spend on human resources rather than on other things. Just the way the Agency of Education has set that up. So we it's our job to know all of these little pieces and nuances, but it was really hard for me to talk about these themes for ARP ESSER because I knew somewhere we hear, oh, but what about? Right, and it may we may have it in our budget or in our other funding streams, but it's just not our presser. So that's why I organized it the way I did. Um, some of this will be very familiar to the board who's just gone through this budget process. Congratulations, by the way, for getting your budget passed um, to all of us uh, overwhelmingly. That was great to see last night. Um, so uh, Anna, let's get get into this a little bit. She's got our controls. 
Um, so I do want to remind the board and for our new members and the students that we do have a theory of growth. Um, and so anything we're thinking about within our funding, thinking about how funding streams and revenues are going to go is fit into this theory of growth. And of course, our theory of growth is matched around four pillars. So what we believe at MRPS is if we meet these four pillars and we're not there yet, um, then we'll ensure that all of our students who graduate from us will have limitless choices in their lives when they grow. So they graduate from MRPS and they can do and have the confidence and skills to make choices. And our four pillars are um, collective responsibility and collaborative practices. Teaching and learning is too complex to do by ourselves. And so we need to be able to do that together. We need to have the efficacy that we can move forward as any of our students, regardless of challenges in our way. Um, we can only do that together. So it's, it's being very systematic about our collaboration. I'm purposeful and focused with that. Formalized essential learning. There is so much learning to be had in this world. We can't possibly do it in our 18 years of schooling that we have with our students. So we have to really decide what are the essential learning pieces. And that's really what we're collaborating on, what we're assessing on, what we're truly looking at and guaranteeing to our families and our students that all students will be proficient in these essential learning standards. We're still working on that. Actually, the pandemic has helped speed that work up considerably. Um, so it was under Mike's direction, which has been fantastic. Our next pillar is timely system to enrich, intervene, and remediate. We actually, through the budgeting process, the board will recognize that we've, we've put a lot of emphasis on this area in terms of human resources over this past budget, as well as um, a couple of years before this, we've been building this system. Um, it was, it was uh, not existent in a way that was functioning when uh, four years ago, when Mike and I took the helm of this work. And we've really put a lot of human resources there, a lot of money to, towards increasing this capacity. Now, we, I feel like with this budget cycle that we just passed, we will have the human resources in place. Now our job is to get them all rowing in the right direction and, and really doing work that's going to move students um, in a way that we haven't seen before. High quality instruction in every classroom that every single one of our teachers has a common understanding of what high quality instruction is that it's not left up to, to choice. There's Anna's email. <laughs> it's not left up to choice um, and chance as to who a child's teacher is. Every child will receive high quality instruction. So I, whenever we're talking about movement forward and how we're spending considerable amount of dollars, we always wanna put these four pillars in front of the school board because they're, they're pieces that we uh, focus our work on. All right, Anna, you can keep going. There's a drag from her from her house. I'm trying to figure out how to do it with that short. I can do it. Okay. So for um, the themes that we heard as the board did considerable amount of communication work with the with the community, which I thank you so much because you knew how overwhelmed and stressful this year was. So the board did a considerable amount of community outreach regarding this. Um, and we heard we heard a bunch too. You know, we we did some um, internal work as well. Um, the major themes that came out as I looked at the documents the board put together, and I looked at the thought exchanges that we did, were the the big themes were we have some infrastructure needs, and it would be um, it it would not be incredibly smart of us to ignore this amount of revenue that has limited constraints on it without thinking about our infrastructure needs and being able to create spaces. Um, for our learners that really matter. We have some social, emotional learning and mental health needs. And, and from internal, as Bill can speak to, internally, our student, many of our students came back with, um, we, the pandemic did one thing for our students, it took community away from them. And so for many of our students, that has been a considerable difference maker in their life and not necessarily a positive one. And so we have learned, you know, I can remember sitting with, uh, with uh, Emma and Mia saying, just hold off a little bit and see what happens and see what you learn when the kids come back. We've learned that we need to put a considerable emphasis on our supports for students around social emotional learning, um, behavior, mental health, that kind of thing. We've al we also have known for years that outside agencies are swamped as well. Um, and so there's the Calvary is not coming necessarily. So we need to build one ourselves. 
Um, special education, we've, that, was a, that was a theme that ran through a lot of the community feedback was really saying, hey, you need to put some more emphasis and some more attention onto our special education systems. Literacy and math also comes, comes out just as, as just a data point. We knew that internally, we've been focusing on that internally and it was emphasized as well from community members and then summer programming in general. So when, we're, when I'm going through this presentation, these are the major themes that I'm gonna be focusing on for these dollars because they were the overarching general ideas that we heard from the community, that we heard from staff, that we heard from our own administrative team um, as, we, as we work through this process. Anna, go ahead. So if we spoke, speak just on infrastructure, keep going, Anna. It's like, wait for it. Just trying to build it, the intensity up a little bit. <laughs> so these particular ARP ESSER, you'll see that there is considerable dollars from the ARP ESSER fund going towards infrastructure. Um, the reason being is we could do a lot of these projects, we wouldn't have been able to do a lot of these projects, um, or we would have had to wait a considerable amount of time. So when we looked at UES and the board has had a few different presentations on these on these projects in more detail so I encourage people to go back to those presentations. Um, and Andrew is here so he can speak more broadly about them if we have any questions. At UES, we're thinking about the special education suite. So if you're in UES, it's a very large area at one end of the building um, that has a lot of office space. And um, I don't know what kind of space in the middle that, that has been reused over the years um, and is not usable space for students right now. So the idea is to take that suite and renovate it and turn it into a 21st century learning space for students with special needs so that it's actually usable for students. Um, particularly those with intensive needs. Uh, UES Little Gym, if you've been in the Little Gym lately um, with Max and Emmanuel, you'll know that that space needs a considerable amount of work. We know there's asbestos in the, in the walls or the ceiling, one of the two. Um, we need to renovate that space so it's safe and it's more usable for our kiddos um, as they're running around like crazy, crazy people in there. At Main Street Middle School, the playground is in desperate need of an upgrade and an update so it matches what adolescent kids need to run and play and do what they need to do outside. Uh, also at Main Street Middle School, something that's been, at, uh, we've talked about when we did the Main Street Middle School Building Committee a few years back before the pandemic hit, um, is the need to seriously look at our cafeteria and kitchen, not only for space issues, for the amount of students we have in there and having them eat comfortably, but also being able to prepare foods in a way, food in a way that uh, kids want to eat it. <laughs> so right now we have a galley kitchen that's kind of out of the, the space is not used to the best of its ability. So Andrew's been working with a kitchen architect um, to really see how we can upgrade that space to make it more usable um, and allow our chefs in the kitchen to do something different in there. Again, at MSMS, this connects to social emotional learning that you'll talk about in a minute. We're, we're talking about building, and this was part of our local budget as well, a Thrive program there. It's for students who are truly having a significant struggle in the classroom with behavior. Um, we need an alternative placement that we kind of make their world less for a little bit to, so regulation becomes a piece and teaching the skills they need to be able to function in a larger world. Um, our, we know that our kids need this right now. And so, but we need a, we need a good space for that to happen um, at Main Street Middle School. So it'd be renovating a classroom space to allow for this type of intensive programming for social emotional learning needs. And then at Montpelier High School here, uh, the transition room, which is upstairs, there's a small kitchenette kind of room right at the top of the stairs. Uh, one of the things that has been floated around for years here in every budget process I've gone through is the need to provide transition services for our students with intensive needs who are, who are leaving us at age 22, um, 21, 22, or ready to go out to, to the world. Um, right now, our job when we have students of that age is to teach them life skills um, so that they can work independent, work and live independently. And so this space would provide us with... Um, the necessary tools to be able to do that life skills training. 
Uh, so it's basically creating a mock apartment using the space that we already have up there. I'm gonna, if you write down your questions and then we can come back to everything, does that work? Yeah, okay. So if we move on to social emotional learning and mental health, go ahead, Anna. Uh, for our district, uh, just the community liaison was put into the local budget that was just passed. Um, so that position um, thankfully is now in our budget, our local budget. Um, in that position, we, you've, the board has heard multiple times, Nick Connor is uh, one of the best hires we've ever made and works with students who are really struggling coming to school, just coming to school um, and getting here. He works closely with families, he's in the community, he's in their homes. He's basically really getting kids here. Um, very small caseload, but he's phenomenal at what he's doing. Uh, we're also thinking about using ARP ESSER funding. So when we're thinking about ARP ESSER, the board does need to know that that's not a, you know, that's a funding source that will dry up, right? So we're thinking that as of right now, the need is really great for another BCBA or a board certified behavior analyst. We have one already in our local budget. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this would be a second one. We believe that this position is one that we may just need for two years. To, to truly get um, a handle on what skills we need to teach our kids. Um, so this is a position when you're thinking about how many positions we're adding into our buser. There are some we're thinking about how do, we, how do we fold into the local budget or another funding source. And there are some that right now with the knowledge that we have right now, which could change, we're thinking that this may be a position that we need for this two year blip. Um, and it may or may not be something that we're looking to put into the local budget. Uh, that, of course, is a district-wide position. At UES, uh, the RISE program, the board actually saw this in the budget presentation, um, and, and we told you this was part of our art professor thinking. Um, and again, this is, this is what we're thinking about as a get us through this two-year blip of um, behavior. So RISE program, very similar to Thrive. Uh, so what we're thinking about is making that type of programming for significant needs uh, in all three of our Montpelier schools. Um, we, have, we have a significant need for it right now. At UES, the board put in a guidance counselor. I just thought it was really important for, for that to be recognized too, that that just passed in the local budget for the second guidance counselor at UES. Uh, we also put in from this local budget, the SEL teacher for Thrive. So when you see Rise and Thrive, think same, same thing, it's just different. UES chose to name it a different thing. <laughs> and so, uh, MHS, the transition, I just added that uh, mock apartment because that was, that's part of mental health and social emotional needs. Um, MHS, MS, MS, and the district, we're adding racial justice advisor, affinity alliance advisor. We're continuing with restorative practices. That is all being funded through local funds as well as ARP IDEA, which the board hasn't heard a whole lot about. It's a smaller amount of money, but that lump of sums bill has been the main uh, point person on. And that's where we're funding a lot of our work with Up for Learning and uh, with John Kitta around restorative practices. Emma was in uh, Montpelier High School interviews today and you heard a lot of the work that's happening there, um, which is great. So that's being paid for about through ARP or IDEA, which is also a two-year grant mm -hmm. that started this year. Uh, the district, one of the pieces that um, I've spoken to Jim about and as our administrative team started thinking about the amount of human resources and programming that we're developing around social emotional learning and mental health. One thing that started to become really apparent is that it was, it was a lot. We have, we're spending a lot of financial dollars there. There's an enormous need in our district. And we feel as an administrative team that we need an administrator overseeing that. And if we don't have an administrator overseeing that, it's haphazard. It, it, it's not together, it's not focused. There's nobody directly overseeing it because all, you know, Mike, Bill and I all have other pieces and it's so important to us to make sure our kids have the skills they need around social emotional learning that we feel we need to put in an administrative position there where their sole focus is on the district's social emotional learning um, goals and programming. Uh, our special education director, it's too much for the special education director to do. 
Um, Mike has other, Mike, it's too much for our director of curriculum and technology to do. So we need, we need an administrative role here. This may be something for the board that's been new. I haven't spoken to the entire board about this yet, um, but I think that we have such a large influx of human resources and programming going into social emotional learning right now that it, I think it's a necessary expense. We decided as a team to put it into ARP ESSER. So of course it's two years and we will be thinking about, is this a position we need to continue or is this a, is it in terms of figuring out how to put in a local funding or is it something that we may not need in two years? We don't know that the answer to that yet, but I do know that based on the programming we're trying to design and uh, the amount of resources we're spending there and the need of the district that an administrator is needed and uh, for that. And then the, other, the last piece here, uh, Mike and I have been talking to the social workers quite a bit around increasing our capacity to offer our mental health services through teletherapy. Um, and we've been, we've been going out to get some bids on what that might look like. So providing a safe space in our school buildings for our students and they do the, the uh, mental health counseling through teletherapy, a uh, teletherapy service. Um, it's something that's an idea out there. We wanted to make sure it was part of our professor plans. We're still in the, let's get some idea, some bid, bids around it. Um, our social workers and our guidance counselors are all behind this idea um, because of the needs currently. So that's social emotional learning and mental health. Go ahead, Anne. When we're thinking about special education, keep going. My organizing slides here. I should have done the clicking. Ah, there we go. So <laughs> it's just to add the intensity. Um, we've been working with John Cronapple around belonging and inclusion professional development this year that may or may not continue next year. We haven't made the decisions around it yet. We've been paying for that out of ARP IDEA. Um, so that's the work he's doing with our equity committee. At UES, uh, we've put in some money for some Orton Gillingham professional learning. This is a definite need in our district to have some expertise around multi-sensory approaches to learning um, reading. And Orton Gillingham is the name of the program. What it is, is it's a very specific targeted um, work with uh, very structured reading that some children need, not all children in any way, shape or form, but some children need uh, that we don't have the expertise right now in the district for that. Um, so it's not currently a service we can really offer at, with any length or expertise. Um, and it's, so it's a piece that we put in here for our IDEA. Uh, we're working with some of our special educators and, and interventionists at UES in particular, because it's for lower grades in particular, um, around this type of programming and developing the expertise. At the district, our IDEA has allowed us to increase our capacity for evaluations. Um, so we do have a school psychiatrist, psychologist who does many of our evaluations. Um, she works out of UES, but she does them for the whole district, correct? Yes, she does. Yeah. Um, and right now where we are just in the world, we needed some more capacity there. So Bill has been contracting out some evaluation services on um, using the RPI IDA money. At MSMS and UES, the Thrive and Rise teachers, which we've already spoken about, that's again being paid for out of ARP ESSER and local funding. And uh, the infrastructure models that we also talked about, many of those infrastructure renovations are, are targeted towards our students with special needs. Um, so the room here, the transition room here, the Thrive rooms, the um, Rise rooms and, and that kind of piece. So that's very much targeted at our students with special needs. And then district, we're trying to find, we had somebody, but we needed to, we need to go back to the drawing board um, to do an outside audit of our special education programming. To, we really want somebody to come in with a very, with some expertise and a fine tooth comb to say, what do we need? Tell us exactly where we need to improve and where we need to go better with our special education programming. Um, so that's in our ARP IDAA funds. And then uh, district, around the district, the behavior supports and the capacity building around behaviors, that's also put into ARP IDEA. So some professional development there. All right, Anna. 
in literacy and math, a lot of this work um, is building our interventionist FTE. Um, so um, as Anna's moving the screen there, one of the things that uh, Mike and I noticed right away when we took over four years ago is that um, we had a very limited amount of interventionists in our system. The, the district has put a lot of money and a lot of support and human resources in some very good programming. Flexible Pathways is an example. We are leaders in the state around our community-based learning and flexible pathways. Um, and we had one interventionist at UES for 400 students. Right? We didn't have the human resources. Um, not only do we not have, did we not have a system, but we didn't have the human resources. So slowly over these past four years, we've built in um, an intervention team. Mike is leading, Mike and Bill are leading the interventionists. We're actually working on our district-wide intervention team combined with special education, our special educators. So with Act 173, which is the new special education funding model that changes the game of who provides intervention and services. So we've been pulling these groups together to get a common understanding of what it looks like for kids. Like how do we do this, these tiered system? Um, so in this particular budget with the revenue sources coming in, we have intervention positions. We've added four FTE with nine total across the district to a tune of $1.6. Uh, so that's paid for out of Title I. It's paid for out of local dollars. We've paid for it out of ESSER II and ARP ESSER. So with these interventionists, as the, the board will see, the ones who are paid for out of ESSER II, have, we have a plan to move them into ARP ESSER funding and then a plan to move them into local funding. These are positions that we will need um, down the line. So um, as Grant and the leadership team built their budget or with these interventionists in mind, we have a plan for how to move these positions into local funding because they are necessary and needed positions. Um, going back up a little bit, uh, we've been working this year with Teachers College Reading and Writing Project uh, for professional development. That's really focusing on the high quality instruction in every classroom for our K, uh, K through sixth grade, right? No, K through eighth grade, sorry. K through eighth grade. We've paid for that, been able to pay for that out of ESSER II funding. In math, we've worked with Teachers Development Group, uh, which is a group out of Oregon that's working with seventh through 12th grade math instructors. Um, and it's really working not necessarily on content, but on mathematical behaviors we want to see in kids and how do teachers provide the mathematical environment to get talk going, to get movement, to, you know, all those really good pedagogical practices to get mathematicians' minds working. We've been working with them for the past two years. The pandemic has made it difficult. It's a coaching model, um, and it's hard to do that during a pandemic, but Mike has move mountains to make it virtual. <laughs> and hopefully next year it will be more in-person work. Uh, and then just a lot of systems development on our multi-tiered system support. We're putting a lot of time, a lot of focus, and a lot of energy to making sure everybody understands where we're going and everybody understands their role and responsibilities within that system now that we have the human resources ready to go. Um, so we're putting a lot of emphasis there. There's professional de development we're looking at through Solution Tree for our, our guiding coalitions, which are teacher leadership teams in each building, as well as for our interventionists and special educators. So we're putting a lot of time and energy and money in that area. Go ahead, Anna. And then summer programming. Last year we had, even though we got it together in May, <laughs> Um, we got a we had a relatively successful program of athletic opportunities for kids. We paid for it, um, and we were able to hire our student athletes to be coaches, um, which was pretty cool. We had a lot of student athletes show up to be coaches. Um, they're they're relatively successful programs. We're going to do that again this year. We'll be free to all students. I have a meeting with Matt Link, who runs it, our, who's our athletic director, tomorrow concerning this trying to expand it a little bit. In addition, any student or any family who qualifies for um, subsidy for after school or summer care, uh, we pay the difference of the subsidy. So anybody who quali any family who qualifies for that essentially gets free all, all summer long part two with our part two program programming. 
um, they never have to worry about it. We just work directly with part two. Um, so that will be in place again this summer. We're paying for those two things through ESSER two funding, um, which we did last summer as well. Go ahead, Anna. I think we're reaching the end here. I added a couple slides. <laughs> It gets my own here. Um, so some other themes that were discussed with the infrastructure, we've talked about the track. We've talked about that as a board and we're, we're actually gonna bring that back. Andrew has done some pre-work on the tracks for the board to consider. Uh, we have it on uh, an agenda in the next couple of meetings. I can't remember exactly which one, but that was discussed as something to use. Climate change has comes up quite a bit in our community feedback. Um, specifically around energy, energy consumption in some of our buildings. Um, and Andrew, I have here so he can talk about the things we are doing towards climate change that aren't necessarily in this presentation because it's a completely other funding kind of piece. Um, and, and the board quite honestly has to have some conversation of if the board truly wants to move into uh, you know, net zero kind of work, then then there's some really hard conversations and decisions the board needs to make because it's a considerable cost. So the track and, and net zero are kind of one and the same for me because they're kind of the similar cost structure that we're, we're guessing. Um, around social emotional learning and mental health, we heard some feedback around uh, offering mentoring specifically for our LBGTQ plus uh, youth. That's actually a Nick Connors job description of the community liaison already it's just it's his first year getting his feet on the ground and we haven't been able to get that moving just yet and there's a lot of needs with with just re-engaging certain segments of our student population that nick has been focused on we heard some trauma and resiliency programming as well um, that we're we can consider for for uh some focused professional development and then summer programming uh we heard some a, a, a bit of feedback around wanting academic remediation for summer programming. Um, and I can talk to why that's not necessarily in our, pro, in our plan right now. Uh, academic remediation over the summer in order for it to make any difference with a student needs to be incredibly intensive, um, meaning five days a week, at least a half day, very structured, very planned, very targeted. Um, we don't necessarily have a system in order to do that. Um, we don't have anybody to run it. We don't have teachers wanting to do it necessarily. Um, we also have a need for extended year services. And once you, once we get teachers doing extended year services, which are mandatory for us to offer, there isn't a lot left for um, remediation for students who do not qualify for extended year services on their IEP. Um, so there's a little bit of a, a need there. Um, and essentially running it, organizing it is not something we've ever done here. We don't have the infrastructure in place for it. Um, and so that's a piece that is not part of this plan as of right now. Um, we can put it in there, it would be a considerable lift, but we could put it in there. And then the last piece we heard was diversifying the staff. We just couldn't figure out what a strategy would be for that. That is a place where myself and our administrative team need help on. <laughs> Put it that way, we just need help on it. And I'm not, we weren't sure what a strategy might look like for money that we would qualify under any of these grants. But it is a theme that we've heard. We understand, we know we need to, to put some thought in. We just, we need some help with that. So we need to look to get some help for that. So uh, we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Two questions for the end. Team. Um, the team, uh, Mike Bill and my Andrew. trio. Right, I guess you're saying the, the conversations about the net zero next to the track expenses is coming. Yeah, you want to talk about sure. climate change first and the things that we've done with climate change efforts, and then kind of what you're thinking as around net zero. Sure. So uh, the um, actually met with some some of the high school students who were working with uh, the VT Digger on doing an inventory. We so was we went through this very recently. Uh, you know, as a district, we have done a tremendous amount of work with regards to making what we have as efficient as possible. 
And some of the projects that have gone through uh, very recently that have been approved is we're going to be doing $200,000 worth of DDC control upgrades here at the high school, which means we're going to use our, our oil as efficiently as possible. As possible. We've uh, got some bids, or we've received a bid for doing heat pumps down at Roxbury to clean ourselves off the fossil fuels. We also have a grant, I don't know if we put it in here yet, but uh, as part of that conversation, Rockbury does not have a DDC control system. So at night, unless someone goes in and turns the thermostats down, it's trying to keep that building at 70 degrees. I've noticed all night long. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I look at is my viewpoint on this, on, on energy efficiency, is get what you've got working as efficiently as possible before you start to solve the bigger issues. And that's a kind of a, a simple, so we're taking care of those simple ones, LED fixtures in all of our buildings. In the last, I think that net zero report that Montpelier put out, I think in the last three to four years, depending on when that report came out, we've reduced our electrical use by like 15%. If you look back more like 15 years, we've reduced it by over 40% in the district through the simple replacement of LED fixtures. We've got a service contract with for our mechanical system, which doesn't it seems very obvious, but we have spent the last two years making sure what we've got is working as efficiently as possible. And, and we've been having standing meetings with our, with our HVAC consultant and our engineers to make sure those things work. So those things we're working on and we're seeing the difference not only in the amount of energy we're using, but the comfort and usability of our buildings. So that's really good. With regards to some of those, especially those uh, projects that were brought forth in the that Montpelier Net Zero report, there are some um, aspects that are absolutely worth looking at, but there's no easy decisions on that because we are city schools and real estate is difficult. Some of the projects, specific projects, you know, uh, using ground source heat pumps at Main Street Middle School. The problem, the challenge is that that used to be a neighborhood back there. There's a lot of stuff underground there. So a lot of these things that we talk about really need to be looked into more closely. And um, we've been, when we look at a project like the track, um, we kind of took that, I took that, uh, that approach in looking at the track where we've been talking about what does it cost? Well, a track over here was X amount of dollars. We actually hired an engineering firm out of Burlington to do a, a proof of concept study on the track. So we actually had them come and visit the site, look at stormwater permitting the issues, look at all of the sort of challenges we have and give us a, a best estimate of what, a, what the cost of that would be. So we kind of got to do that proof. I would say as we move forward, if, if those sort of net zero type projects want to be considered, we have to do that first. We have to go and say, okay, what are our challenges? And what are the engineers saying? What are we thinking? Just so we can get our heads around what it is before we, you know, fine tune it from there. So the other thing that, that wanted to be clear on is that all of our buildings, all the electricity we do use in the district, 85% of it is from solar. So there's a lot of this that I'm very pleased that the building uh, committee is going to be get going because there's a lot of this. A couple of years ago, I presented a 70 page facilities report. And I got one this year ready to go as well that, that I've look forward to presenting to that group so they can kind of get an understanding and then once we I answer their questions we can get it out to the folks as well so there's there's been a tremendous amount of work that's been going on and if we want to hit those other goals um we need to do we need to do more work and and really bring in some professionals to really guide us through that process do you have a follow up well yeah, I mean, we have a lot of <clears throat> short term funding. We need to do a lot of planning with people that are going to do proof of, proof of concept stuff. Are, are, are we using it? Are we, are there, is there, is there some pockets of that funding that's yet to be allocated or is it kind of have to be? Allocated well, or? when we're talking about the track, we're not talking about any revenue source well, other than our, um, <clears throat> other than our, 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 sorry, totally mind blanking right now. Our savings account. <laughs> you know, that's it. Thank you, fund yeah. balance. Sorry, total mind blank. Right. So, so one of the things that when we have the conversation and which is on a future a future agenda coming soon, is 
if we want to use that fund balance, which we want to use soon, um, considerable fund balance on something like the track, or do we want to start, or do we really want to hit these net zero energy goals with that money? Because that's the amount of money we're talking about with some of the differences. And, and unless a bond is suggested, which I don't, I'm not suggesting in any way, shape or form, I don't believe we can do both irregardless of the revenue sources that are coming in now. Right, I think I, what I, I could be wrong, but I think what I heard you ask me is, are those items getting, whether, well, we haven't said we want to get to net zero, but if we were to say that in the track, are they included in this ARPS or plan? Is that no. what you're asking? No, no okay. I'm, I'm, I, if, 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 there's a lot of complications that come with ground source heat pumps at MSMS. Is there any work being done to get whatever contractor finds out what exactly would be involved in that? Like, if, I imagine that if this, if the city, if the district is looking at the choice between a track and net zero, we need there's to have a lot us. more, it's a lot more complicated than that, and more information about what how long that process of getting to net zero, it seems like a long process. You could throw a million dollars at it and it would be done, but it would still take probably five to 10, maybe not 10 years, but quite a bit of time, I imagine. Um, maybe not, maybe it's easy, but it seems like a lot needs to be determined about how to even get there. Well, I would, yes and no, that a 40,000 foot sort of just analysis of Okay, if, if speaking of the high school, if you wanted to burn biomass at the at the high school, what would you do? Well, if you want to use chips, it, you're going to need a silo. You're going to need a building. You're going to need a place to turn a truck around. You're going to have to decide what real estate to chew up. If it's you want to use pellets, that that sort of forty thousand foot study is not a crazy amount of money. I mean, it's, all money is important, but it's not something that we, I think we'd have to budget too, too far. I think we can probably in a normal year, if it becomes really important, we can kind of pull this and shake that and we'll, we'll wait a year on that and we can pull that together and to be able to do that. Um, that sounds interesting. I think Eric had a question. Yeah, so how much of ARPS or funding still needs to be like developed? Good question. So what we saw here in the board packet, did you guys get the board packet? Yeah. yeah. So there was also a, a spreadsheet and what the Agency of Education asks us to do in our initial application is to basically spend it all. It doesn't mean that that's how it's gonna go, right? So SR2 is a really good example. We were able, because of once you start spending and some things don't cost as much as you think it's gonna cost. And you know all of these figures are kind of guesstimates, our best guesstimates. Um, you often have $50,000 left over that has to be spent because it's a grant, right? You're gonna lose it if you don't spend it. So that's why teachers college professional development and the math professional development, that's why all of that is being spent out of ESSER too because we had money available. That was already plugged for our, our professor, but we were like, we have the ESSER too, let's spend it out of that one instead. And we can use the ARP ESSER for something else. Um, so the application, we haven't put the application in yet. This is like our first, like, or one of many iterations actually about public <laughs> feedback and things like that. Um, but what, you, what you're seeing is here's the dollar amount they're saying, here's our best guesstimate to get to that dollar amount we may make amendments, we will make amendments because every grant we make amendments with um, over time because it's a two-year grant. And we and they're just estimates, they're our best guess. Some aren't, some aren't, some aren't, you know, contract costs, we know how much a teacher is gonna cost, but that's, that's. So this plan essentially spends all our best work. Right. Um, I wrote down a note where I was like, I wonder if anyone, might want a little refresher on what ARP ESSER is versus ESSER 1, ESSER 2, you know, like. Yeah, I thought about that when I started talking. Maybe just a quick refresher on what that yeah. is. So the federal government provided four different funding sources, and maybe Grant should speak to this better than I can, but spent, provided four different funding sources once the pandemic hit. The first one was around COVID. I, I think it was actually called COVID. 
relief or, relief something. or something like that. And that was basically spent on PPE and food and all that kind of good stuff. Um, that was right off the bat. ESSER 1 came through next as a relief measure and what we really spent that primarily on, and this is all in the public plan document that's on our website, was one-to-one -one computing for, for students because we had to go virtual. And so we needed a lot of virtual devices for students. And so um, ESSER 1 primarily was around that. And then we also, because we had done it, just finished with a literary, literacy audit, which one of the glaring findings was uh, our classroom libraries at the middle school we had that as a glaring finding. So we had ESSER 1 money available at that moment and we had to spend it relatively quickly. And so we bought the one-to-one -one devices and then we bought a massive amount of uh, classroom libraries that Mike can speak to for Main Street Middle School that we knew we, our teachers weren't actually ready to dig into yet, but we had the money available, so we have it. Um, and then ESSER 2 came along after ESSER, ESSER 1, ESSER 1 and 2 did, and, and the COVID relief had no requirements for community engagement or feedback or anything like that attached to it. ESSER 2 came along. Um, we put in some interventionists around that in ESSER 2. Community liaison was originally paid for out of ESSER 2. We've now smoothed that out. Um, we have professional development, our summer programming, that kind of thing all came out of ESSER 2. Um, and that was basically the way we we used that money was was judging what our immediate need needs were in that moment in time. I think we actually bought some devices out of that too. Yeah. Esser too. Um, and our Esser has some different. It was a longer process. Like the agency of education told us we could put an application in like three weeks ago. Like it was a much longer process for our Esser and the development of it. It's a lot more money, and there are a lot more strings attached to how we can use that money and where we can use it. Um, some of the money needs to be spent towards what the federal government has called um, learning loss, uh, and some of it can be spent on other things, but a certain, a certain percentage has to be spent on learning loss, which we are way above that percentage now um, with how this particular plan. Um, but we've gone through many iterations of how we thought we could spend it. Originally, we thought windows, let's do windows, as the board will remember. The windows are now in the capital plan because we just decided it was a better use of our time. We got some really good feedback around, hold on, just don't go so fast with this. Um, and the agency of education didn't allow us to go fast anyways. <laughs> so it kind of forced our hand on that one. Um, but that was that was good. We got that feedback. We went back to the drawing board. We thought, which, which funding source do windows make sense? We know we have to do the windows. So now that's in the capital plan and it's the original plan with the windows of moving them across multiple years. Um, and so this ARP ESSER, again, some of it has to be done guaranteed towards learning loss and others can be used for other pieces and you have to get public, you have to get public engagement as to um, how to spend the dollars too. There's also, if you're talking about those trends as well, there's also been the Vermont indoor air quality. Oh yeah. So it was round one and there's gonna be a round two as well coming up that we'll, we've got a couple projects that we'll put in for, we'll see. Yep, and we bought, 10 bazillion air purifiers and mm -hmm. the H, yeah. the, yeah. So the like controls and all that kind of stuff. 150,000 on that one in the first round. We'll see what the second round comes up with. I, I would just like to appreciate that this is massive. This is such a significant, thoughtful plan. I mean, when I think about this, I'm like, we're talking about creating schools within schools, like Thrive and Rise and additional administrator. And I just see like, so much value in so many of these concepts and these ideas. And I think it's really exciting. And it feels like in kind of the, you know, the values work that we've done, it feels really in sync with, with a lot of what we've been talking about. So it feels really exciting. I have to imagine it feels pretty exciting to you all in terms of like the scope of your work. Libby, I'm particularly happy to be able to hear you talk about education <laughs> in the nuts and bolts and nitty gritty, and also getting to be like really innovative. Um, and really trying to address what the needs are. Um, so I'm just really excited about this. So thank you for all the work. It just feels huge. Um, as I have so many questions that are just based on curiosity because I'm yeah. sort of like a school nerd, but I also just want to, um, yeah, but I'm gonna try to stick to just some other things. Um, as far as the SEL administrator, which does seem prudent because it's a lot of different programs that seem to be coordinating, 
Um, and I'm hearing there's maybe, you know, seeing how that goes, it could get, you know, continued through the local budget. But say if it doesn't, you know, in that role, is there anything that, if it's going to be temporary, is there anything that could come out of that position that would be lasting in terms of like systems development? Yeah. Sort of looking at what already is, is not optimal um, and kind of fixing that and getting the systems in place. So I'm just curious how, what that could look like. Um, if we can't yeah, that's actually one of the major pieces as to why we want to want to have somebody with the expertise and the focus so that systems development can happen. Um, right, right now, I'll be honest, it's, it's just haphazard. You know, it's, it's based on what the need is in that moment and it's reactionary. So what we want to create is a system that's not reactionary, that's proactive, that, that it works within a program so that kids, we know which skills kids need to build and we know how to build them with the kids and the families. I can't say we know that right now with our, with our truly, um, with our tr kids who are truly really having a challenging time with typical school. Uh, we don't know how to do it right now. So we need that level of expertise at this moment. And the I ideal would be that they work themselves out of a job. You know, that would be the ideal. It may not happen. It may not happen in two years, and we may be having to have some hard conversations of how to do our local budget or using other revenue sources. But if in the ideal world, if everything worked well, <laughs> then they'd work themselves out of a job. And so the timing of the, the funding will allow for that new administrator to come on when kind of these programs are also coming online. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and then just this is a thought about so the next step will be to put this in front of the public and get comments, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, it could be helpful for folks, you know, just there's there's some jargon and acronyms that might be helpful to demystify for folks, um, even just like SEL, MTSS. And I don't want to, that could be a massive glossary endeavor. <laughs> However, I think it could be helpful so people like know what they're looking at. I'm kind of raising my hand and like, would be helpful maybe? <laughs> oh, I was just thinking Mike would love to do that. But I just think so people know what they're looking at. Um, and let's see, um, as far as the, uh, like the summer enrichment programming, like how will that be made, made available? And I did hear, and I was actually, actually interested, I don't want to put you on the hot seat, but if our students would, or are interested to weigh in on what summer enrichment programs they feel students would appreciate and would want to see offered, I would love to hear from you on that, either now or later. Um, but it sounds like you're going to be having a conversation with the coordinator of that. Yeah. I'm just interested, like, is it going to be kind of an RFP that's put out to the district educators if they want to offer something? And I'm also thinking about our um, middle and high school students um, in Roxbury and um, just how they might plug into the opportunities. Last year, they were made. Um, our students didn't have transportation necessarily to get to the program. So I also know transportation is... Um, Exorbitantly expensive, and that makes that can dwindle a budget very, very quickly. Um, but I'm just curious, you know, I think about those, you know, but there we're not, we're not in city, you know, we can't just kind of go in town and that's our activity for the day. So, um, I mean, it could, it would just be a stop at the Rockstar Country Store. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm just curious how we might think about integrating those students into what those plans could be because I'm really interested in them having just social um, opportunities. Yeah, transportation is the B. Yeah. And how do you figure that out? I, again, I have a meeting with Matt tomorrow um, who coordinates this for us. Again, he's our athletic director. Um, so he did it last year. I also have sent a survey out to our um, faculty and staff asking, hey, anybody interested in, in, in what might you be interested in doing? So it was an anonymous survey just to get an idea from people. Um, so I'm going to go back to that with Matt. I'm going to talk that through with him tomorrow um, about how can we expand what was offered last year because it was pretty primarily sports last year. We literally got the money like Mar May 15th and planned it like in a week. Um, so it was what Matt knew, and that's what we went with, which was understandable. Um, so we're that piece will be, we'll talk about it tomorrow because we have a little bit more time now. Although I know that summer, as a parent, I know that summer planning is happening now. <laughs> and so that we'll, we'll move relatively fast because we have, you know, last year we had to figure out how do we pay people? How do we, you know, like we had to figure so many just right. basic steps out because we've never done anything like that before in the summer. 
Um, but now we figured that part out, right? So uh, now we can focus more on the actual programming. I'm not sure if we have anything on the like top of our minds right now regarding that, but we can get back to you on like, what students would like to see. One last. Um, so you mentioned uh, bumping up to I think nine interventionists across the district. Is that where we are now, Mike? Can you count them on the top of your head? Okay. So I'm just curious what the spread of the interventionists are across the district, and if that ever becomes fluid, if they're like school assignments, or if like, oh, we're having more need at MSMS right now, we're going to bump uh, you know. So I'm just kind of curious how that how that works and how fluid it is. So the fluidity comes from we did have some fluidity at. UES this year because of a small kindergarten class. We had too many teachers for the amount of students. So um, one of our kindergarten teachers became a K-1 interventionist this year. Based on our projections, she's going to stay there. Uh, the kindergarten and first grade team loved that. Um, she's phenomenal at it. <laughs> it's a need to target the littles like that, particularly right now. Think about it. Our kindergartners did not have a typical daycare experience, so, you know, that some or pre K experience that many kids do. So, our kindergartners are interesting this year, um, and they'll be interesting next year, too. And so, uh, that definitely has been a need. That's been where our fluidity comes the most. Um, in terms of, we're not good enough in our data yet to say there's more need in our fifth grade in this area in literacy. We're not good enough yet with our data. Mike, do you want to talk to that? Yeah, about the data or the- Or just interventionists in general, yeah, so where we are. I think there's a couple of things that are coming up now. One is that blend of intervention and special education that's happening. So that's, that's, that's huge. Bill and I obsess over that often. Um, so we're, you know, we're spending a lot of time, as Libby mentioned, working with the special educators and interventionists to just talk about how, how do we help kids. Um, regardless of your title and what are the how do we identify the need how do we identify the skill how do we use research to really tap that skill quickly um, and we're trying to move away from that model of okay this kid needs help they're going to be in a small reading group five times a week 30 minutes for the rest of their life um, we're trying to really move away from that and be more diagnostic about what we're doing um, so we're building that that skill set in everybody with common language across all four schools, which is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, the other thing with interventionists is they, they tend to be um, content specialists as well. So there's not as much fluidity in one person moving from different areas of support. So if you're a math interventionist, that's pretty much your jam. That's what you do. And we we're, we're are starting to have some conversations between transitional grades. So fourth to fifth grade, and then eighth to ninth grade about supports and intervention. So there's a little bit of overlap and fluidity and conversation and resources there. Um, that's been really interesting. So like at the high school, we have a literacy interventionist for the first time this year. And that person is working with the middle school interventionist to really talk about what are the strategies they're using because it's similar ranges of needs. Um, so there's a lot of good crossover there. But think about that statement. We have a 400 student middle or high school. We did not have a literacy intervention right. until this year. It's crazy. Here, ever. Like, it's not just because somebody left. Like, we've never had an interventionist right. at the high school. It's the same with math. Right. So, like, we just didn't have the human resources we needed for that piece. Yeah. And then data, that's pretty much all we're working on right now, is building our base level systems to be able to track data and be able to be really specific about what kids learning is telling us about our instruction. So we're building these base level systems and I could geek out for like an hour and maybe one or two people would like that Phil would leave. <laughs> no, um, no, it, would it's, so we're building computer systems, database systems, all sorts of things to be able to make it easy for school teams to look at data and make decisions about instruction and what kids need. Um, 
and easy for us to share with the community as to what our data is telling us as to where we are. That is not, an, that should be very easy for us to do, and it is not. So we're putting a lot of effort in there. It's not easy because there's not a system or just right. kind of translating the. It's not, there's not a system. There's, there's not a system in for a long time. <clears throat> Excuse me. The buildings were isolated. So they didn't cross talk. One school was using one program, another and another, and just make it difficult. Yeah, can you can you share with me your your reading assessment data, and we get we get uh, like Google Sheets, <laughs> like we just get Google, some yeah. had all the data in it, some didn't. You know, it was just I couldn't I couldn't look it up myself. Yeah. I have to have somebody share with me on Google. It just wasn't. It's not the way it needs to be. We'll fix it. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I, I also just want to start off by acknowledging and appreciating the evolution of this plan from the beginning. You know, Libby, you mentioned that a lot of it at the beginning was about the windows. And I just, I see a lot of what um, we have heard from the community and the um, through the thought exchanges and through the listening sessions. And I imagine also through the conversations you all have had and the um, input you've been getting from teachers reflected in this plan. And I just wanted to you know, acknowledge that and say, I just really appreciate the the effort that went into that to gather all of that. And I also wanted to, for the members of the community who are watching our our recordings, um, say thank you to them for, for sharing what their needs are and what their dreams are and their ideas. Uh, because this to me feels like a true reflection of uh, of, of all of that. Um, so that was the first thing I wanted to say. And I do have just a couple of questions. One is, it's feeling like um, some of those infrastructure needs, the space ones in the schools are pretty acute right now, but I also am imagining that infrastructure is a little bit of a slow process. Do you have a sense of how quickly something like the Thrive Space or that special ed space could be Ready to go? Yeah. So um, Bill and I were talking about that today. Um, there are some places that we need to get on on board this summer, the Thrive and the, the Rise space. We need to make those spaces appropriate for next year. There's some other projects, even just district wide, other projects, capital projects, and other that we've got to think about what's the economy going to look like this summer? Are we even going to be able to get stuff? You know, we've also got new we've got new staff in some of our buildings. And we've had two years of just thrashing around. We kind of need a year to relax, not relax, but to, to gather our breath, let that new staff get a handle on their buildings and just get things back in line. And the idea of even when we look at a project like the auditorium, we go, well, it's just one room, it's one spot. But even just talking with Tara, who's over at the communion now, um, just, you know, that 15 minutes of the electrician saying, hey, do you know where the box is for that? It's just, it's just going to. Throws off the rhythm. It throws off the rhythm, and they really need to get into their buildings. And they've yeah. done a tremendous amount of work, and they're going to they're going to continue to do that. So it's sort of this: what can we do? What do we have to do? There's some things we have to do for the students. There's some stuff, and also just bundling the projects. We've got a lot of money to spend, and spending it all at once is more efficient, and you get more bang for your buck. We're going to have a year's worth of inflation, but. We also don't want to tear our buildings about apart to not be able to get the materials that we need. Right, and that's going to be a real issue. So we're, we're, I'm internally having that conversation, and that'll be another great thing to bring towards to the, the facilities committee to bounce those ideas of, you know, this is what we're seeing. What do you, what do you guys think? So there are some definite spaces that we need to get ready. Drive and rise spaces, especially in here at the high school, the, the transition space. We can get those. They're small projects. Let's get them done. They may not be. The full vision, but at least they'll be appropriate for next year. Um, the bigger ones, again, it's we, we always like to say you, know, you want to build it as early as possible, but there's some stuff. I mean, you can't you can't get paint right now. I mean, you literally can't get paint. So, wow. do we hire a painter to paint the auditorium for material they can't get? So, you know, like, so. The other reality that Andrew's pointed out quite a quite a few times is uh, to me is that our building season or renovation season is relatively short. You know, we're talking about mid June to mid August, yeah, and that's the time we have. <laughs> um, and UES is is busy. And part two is at UES during the summer, so you yeah. know, there's 
there's limited things we can do at one time. So we have to pick and choose. And Andrew's yeah. very good at prioritizing those things. Yeah, and I, I, I think that bundling as much as this for next year is probably the way to go because we can get we can get our contractor, our construction manager, whomever on board really early and they that's what they do is they organize it's all about logistics and yeah. i have capacity to a point but they have the capacity and the, the muscle to sort of first force people to come to this job versus that job kind of thing so and when you say next year do you mean next school year or next summer year? of 23 summer of 23 we in 22 now yeah, summer 23 okay yeah so realistically, what we're saying is that there won't be a rise or a thrive space. Oh, no, no, no. Those are this summer. There'll be a space. Yeah, yeah, got yeah. It. yeah, yeah. Got it. Okay. it may, may evolve into something more got next it. summer, but the very we'll have the, 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 those types of spaces that we know we need to have ready. Those we uh -huh. can get ready for the summer. And the special ed space? That one, time. that one, again, there's also the capacity of the administration and the people that use it. That takes, you talk about the, the special ed suite not being, I, I've designed a lot of those and I can I can envision the conversations around why that space looks the way it does. And those aren't the same conversations that we would have now. So it's going to take a couple months to get people to talk about what that space wants to look like. And I think that's a yeah. burden that I'm not sure that we're in a position to quite do that yet. Got it. Um, so going a little bit slower to make sure that we've got what we want that's going to last us for 20 or 30 years is, is worth is worth waiting a year to try to try to get it done for this summer. You want to you want us? You got, you got it two hours a week for the next uh, four weeks. So. I think it would be difficult. <laughs> I think it would be difficult. Yeah. No, I think what you need to hear is that you know our focus on on changing any of these spaces is getting back to a kid centric model Absolutely. for the space. Um, uh, it, it feels like that's been drifted away in some of the spaces, um, especially the you know the, the sped suite up at UES. So um, certainly we're looking to create the environment in the space that's adapted to students and to particular uh, student needs, um, be that drive or high needs um, um, students. In, in the best of times, it would take six, eight months just to talk about it. And what about this? And change and have different iterations of things before everybody can have their heads together. So like in the best of times, it's take a good six months to do that. Yeah. Thank you. I think so. Yes. yes. Um, for the uh, positions like the um, like the racial justice advisor, the affinity alliance advisor, and the restorative practice of professional development, um, I know the funding is listed as local and the ARP IDEA. Um, do we know if those positions will be able to continue in the same capacity sort of when that ARP funding runs mm -hmm. out or is that gonna be a problem? The restorative practices professional development is in the ARP IDEA grant. Um, the, uh, the positions are in the, are in the local budget. Um, and we actually move those late in the game in the budgetary process to during the school day because you all are the most important part of that work. And so we want to make it equitable for all students. So the, the goal is to have those, those clubs and those uh, opportunities for students during your school day. So it's not, hey, I can come from three to four or I have to choose between two things, right? Um, so teachers are paid for their school day. So there's actually not a huge budgetary expense if we move it into the school day, right? It's more of a time, how do we get the time to work? Um, the restorative just the restorative practices work is, is something that we know we will have to figure out how to do but and honestly it's not a considerable sum of money uh, so that that is one that right now is in our IDEA because it's a grant fund that we have available to us it will easily be able to be absorbed into our our local budget and I think ultimately the plan is is to release that responsibility to the staff to lead restorative practices yeah. so it doesn't need to continue on and on. In the same vein, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Zach. Um, other questions? Um, I have one. Uh, so I'm going to echo what Kristen and Mia both said about just like being so pleased that this pro that the process that has brought us to 
this proposal that's in front of us today because it's it does feel very responsive to the community and all the input that was uh, received. So I really appreciate that. I'm super excited about the idea of a district administrator for the SEL work. That's, oh, good. I was nervous about that. So good. <laughs> I, I'm excited about that. Yeah, I think that's really great. Um, and one thing that sort of most of my questions have been answered, but one thing that did come up with the um, student listening session in the library, I think Zach, you were there for that. I don't know, Merrick, were you there for that? It was here, but um, we came and we just sort of did a, like an open listening session around kind of around the ESSER funding budget stuff. Um, and one of the things that was requested that I thought was like a really great idea, and I know we're limited with actual physical space in this building, but it was a um, like a student lounge collaboration space. Mm -hmm. And I just um, didn't see it on the other themes. And I know yeah, no, 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 theme, that's good. Yeah, you're right. It might be nice to add that in there just so that it stays on our radar as something that it seems like the students wanted. Um, and it might be nice to start, you know, because of the way you're talking about the way that <laughs> it's it's slow work. You know, we would need to like think about where to put it. We need to do the studies. We need to get the drawings. We need to get the contractors. We need to buy the materials. So it's probably already a couple years out to to implement something like that, unless it was a space that was already currently in the building. Um, so it just it, it just feels like something that we should put on back on the radar. Yeah, I added that. Thank you. I added that to the other themes discussed because that definitely came up and it came, it's come up in a couple of places. Yeah. Um, so the space is the big, the big challenge with that. But there's also the piece of our high vaccination rate in this grant that the Agency of Education has offered yeah. to cases with high vaccination rate. So we haven't decided how we, we did put out a thought exchange to the students way back when around how to use that um, funding. So, and we got some great ideas around air conditioning and building the track and, <laughs> and the creamy machine. And the, those were the top three vote getters. Um, <laughs> I can buy one of those, <laughs> that 10 grand. <laughs> um, but that might be something that we would, we can consider. We, def, we just have to figure out space. Um, but but something like six seven $7,000 could definitely get us a good start in something like that. So, I'm sorry. But I, I'm... <laughs> Because we have high vaccination rates, we're eligible, eligible for, for grant money. Yeah. Okay, I didn't realize that. We yeah. are. We have. It's. We've been eligible for a while. We were eligible in our three Montpelier schools for it. And um, that would be something that could a funding source that could come immediately. Yes. Because okay. Yeah, it's just it's just a matter of putting our heads together with um, Tom and Chris here and saying and the principal and see okay. where my, where we might be able to do that. I'm not sure. Yeah. The, the other thing with regards to schedule was the money have to be spent by September of 24, correct? Yeah. So, yeah. So, it yep. would, it most likely, we'd like to do most of the heavy lifting next year. So, things, if anything goes awry, we, we have time to finish that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. So, how much money is coming from that uh, like high vaccination rate grant? It was, I think it's 6,700. Uh, so, not enough for air conditioning upstairs, mm -hmm. definitely. But, <laughs> cream but a cream yeah. machine, we could definitely do cream machine. Yeah, I feel like you can probably buy a few, like maybe yes. a popcorn, cream, and cotton candy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. let's not do cotton candy. Full popcorn. Full popcorn. But yeah, we have about sixty-seven hundred. So if you all want to want to reach out to people again to think about how we want to use that, we can we can literally put that grant in next week and get those dollars like two weeks from now and is, um, that, is that money also spread out throughout the district, or the district no so each of our three montpelier schools who have reached the 80 percent vaccination rate um all it's a dollar amount tied to the number of students so it's all or because our schools are relatively the same size it's all around 65 to seven thousand wow. and zach you had an I, just going back to the student lounge, um, because that also, I also noticed that I don't remember the name of the club, but there was a group that presented a book listening session um, that had ideas specifically around space and whatever, um, all those things that could definitely be helpful if that's something to consider. I think they did like a lot of work, yeah. like a proposal. 
we can talk about it more on Friday, I guess. I was going to say, you guys already asked a lot of good questions, so um, which some of them are the same as mine. I was just wondering, um, does the money, what the like big picture time frame of when it has to be spent by or encumbered by, is there a chance, is there a possibility that because of the supply and the lack of, like, I'm not sure we'll find all these magical people to fill these positions, if there's a really quick timeline, like, do they sweep it and take it back if it doesn't get spent by a certain time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll spend it. Okay. So if if the positions don't be filled aren't filled, then we'll spend it on some. We'll look to something else, right? So that's when the amendment process comes in. Um, the the positions that we have in here, actually, I've already posted an anticipated SEL administrator because I was going to twist your arms um, to <laughs> approve. So actually, I actually have some qualified candidates for that. I, put, I, I had Heather post it right before break. Um, not doing any interview or anything like that yet, just anticipated. So um, we'll probably take that anticipated off um, that piece and, uh, and get going on that hiring process because we do have some good candidates right now. The BCBA, we do not, we haven't posted that yet. Um, so we can get going on posting an anticipated one for that piece. That would be probably looking at Looking at these positions, I would, I'm venturing to bet that that would be the hardest one to fill. Yeah, that'll be difficult. That's a, a tough license to, to come by. And they can make pretty good money in the private field. Mm -hmm. um, and do you have to have a teaching certificate to work in public education? So there's lots of hurdles and roadblocks that, right. yeah. um, around that. But after, of all the other positions, I think we'll be able to find people. But Jill just jogged my memory, Mike. Can you remind me tomorrow to remind UAS to post the guidance counselor position? Thank you. Um, other questions? Great. Well, thank you again. I just want to echo what um, several board members said. This is fantastic work and a really great process. Uh, very responsive and uh, the outreach, the outreach on behalf of everyone. I mean, I want to thank all this, all the administrators for doing it, but also you know, several board members for really helping with um, getting feedback and getting processes of feedback. So a real group effort. Um, yeah, no, and, and thank you, uh, Mike, Bill, and Andrew for uh, staying till the bitter end. Um, Talking about the bitter end, we have one uh, one more item. Uh, um, first reading, uh, yeah, thank you. First reading of uh, C14, um, which is a new recurrent policy regarding uh, level four. Uh, and just any comments or edits on that? We have three readings and then we uh, approve as part of the consent agenda. But if there's anything that strikes you as needing attention on this policy or question you have, uh, now is the time to, to raise that. Has the policy committee looked at it yet? Or is yes. this? Oh, okay. We looked at it and we decided to move it forward as is because of other conversations we've had about other required special ed related policies. Uh -huh that um, we've had conversations with our district lawyer about and with Bill and Libby, and it just doesn't make sense. You're, you're not really supposed to kind of mess with them. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You leave them alone. Okay. I think that's the smartest thing to do. So we're, we're putting it forward as is from um, the BSBA, uh -huh. for, at least for the first round. So if there was anything that you see it was a relatively quick look through from the policy committee, but that was sort of our gut. That was what we, our gut reaction to it. Well, I admit on this first one, I also did a pretty quick look through myself, especially yeah. as it got further in it. It was more about the process that didn't, that didn't feel, I definitely agree. I don't think we should touch that. Right. The one thing that stood out to me is that it, it could benefit. And again, this is a little bit more from a, like making our 
policies accessible to the community. It could benefit maybe from a couple of sentences at the top that say, this is our intent. This is the impact we want this policy to have, or this is our, yeah, our intended, our intention around it is, and maybe it is even just of all about like ensuring that every child in our district has the access to the education that they need. And that it's as simple as that, but it felt like it could use something like that so that it, um, again, mostly so that when people in our community access our policies and say, what's this all about? It's at least there's something that's in plain English. <laughs> <laughs> right at the top. Yeah, we were we were trying to do that sort of as a matter of best practice. So I think we will take a step at that. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question. Yeah, uh, there are a couple of superscript numbers, but could you find any footnotes? First paragraph itself, middle of the paragraph, federal financial assistance with superscript one. And then there's another one. Yeah, and then there's like a three. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> there's no two or two factors. <laughs> right. But I couldn't find what one, two, or three might be there. Um, We'll have to ask. Amanda was the one that did the sort of initial like yeah. changes to suit the needs. So I wonder if that was just like a accidental a translation. Um, so we'll take a look at that too. Thank you. Any other questions, comments on first reading? We'll look at those two issues. Um, Policy read. Uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thanks, everyone.